This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Using the words of the call to worship, let us come before God with praise. We are from north and south. We are from tiny apartments and expansive homes. We're from this city and others far away. We are from big families and dinners made for one. We're from stages of grief and stages of love. We are from hot summers and cold winters. We're from kitchens with passed down recipes and front porches with old familiar swings. We are from the dust of the earth and the stars of the sky. We're from a lot of places, but today we are here. Today, we are together. Holy God, gather us in. It's my blessing to call on our liturgist for today, Andrew Ard, who will lead us in the prayer of confession. Let us confess our sins before God using the prayer of confession shown in your bulletin and on your screen, followed by a time of silent prayer and personal confession. Almighty and merciful God, when people heard that Jesus was from Nazareth, they ask, can anything good come from Nazareth? We confess to you, God of beginnings, that we have asked the same question. Can anything good come from that part of the country, from that side of town, from that political party, from that family history, from that school, or from that profession? Can anything good come from a faith with doubt, from a body or mind with illness, from a church with faults. Forgive us, God, for doubting you are in all things at all times. Open our eyes to see your goodness, not as something that resides here or there, but as the expansive grace that it is. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear again the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We're invited to come and see and also be seen, be seen as we are, be seen 
for all that we are. And in Christ, to know the joy of discipleship, angels descending and ascending from the kingdom of heaven. And this, this way of seeing the world gives us a peace that passes all understanding, a peace that is too big and too good for us to keep to ourselves. And so we pass it one to another. The peace of Christ be with you. You can wave at each other. You can take a moment to intentionally see who is with us in this place. You can commit to who you're going to reach out to with Christ's love today. Amen. reading from Genesis 2, verses 4b through 15. Listen to the word of God. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground. But a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, to till it and keep it. Here ends this reading from God's word. And now we come to our time for the children's message. And I want to thank Kara Blythe for helping me out this morning. But as we gather together, I want to invite all the children of whatever your age to gather around your screens, to put your hands together, to close your eyes, to bow your heads, and as we pray uh, to after me, dear God, dear God, we love you. We love you. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from you. Help us to listen. Help us to listen. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Well, today, Pastor Beck is going to be preaching a sermon about where are you from? And Kara, are you busy with something right now? What are, you, what are you working on? I'm researching my family history to learn where I come from. It turns out my family comes from a lot of different places. A long time ago, my family lived in Wales, but then they moved to New York, and now I live here. Where do you come from, Pastor Stephen? Well, 
I, I guess it depends on how far back you go. The Bible says humans were first created, as we just heard, out of the earth and placed in the Garden of Eden. So in a way, that's where we all come from, isn't it? That's true. And yet, we're all from different places that make us who we are. Like Jesus was from Na Nazareth, out in the sticks. People thought nothing good could come from Nazareth. Wow, were they wrong. Yeah, it sounds like where I'm from, or at least where I was born. You know, some people don't like Texas. But I really don't know much about my family before all of that, other than maybe they were some of them, at least one branch from England. But do you think that's something we could learn about together? I'd love to help. That'd be great. I wonder what we would find out if we all looked to try to see where we're from. Perhaps, you know, I'm wondering if everybody could think about, you may already know, some people spend a lot of time figuring out where their families come from or where they're from right now. And it's important though to remember where we all come from in the same place in that way that we're all from God. Each one of us is a child of God. Each one of us has our source and our family in the family of God, no matter what. And that connects all of us together. And one of the ways that we are definitely connected is that we have this prayer that Jesus shared with us to pray together, to share together, to pray to God through Christ together. We call it the Lord's Prayer. So I'd like to invite everybody to put your hands together, close your eyes, bow your heads, wherever you're from, to know that we are from God and we pray to God using this special prayer from Jesus. Let us pray. Our Father, who art from heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we come to our second scripture lesson. And this scripture in particular reminds us that Christ finds us where we are. So listen now for the word of God as it comes to us from John 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me and for me?
Lord, here we are. Yes, we may be from other places, from hot, worried places, from cold, barren places, from sunny, distracted places. But we are here now. And to us, you say, come and see. Open our eyes to your love. And in my words, may your people hear your word and follow you. Amen. The last time the cicadas hit, it was the summer of 2004, and I was a chaplain at the Georgetown Hospital. I remember the, their drone as I'd sit on the sun-baked patio outside the main entrance. It was a ripe place for people watching. And there's a very human thing that happens when someone is walking with purpose and is dive-bombed by a cicada. You know what that looks like, the yelp, the hair fluffing, the looking around to see who noticed. And there's a, a very human thing about hospitals in general. They practically buzz with our screaming hopes. And I would sit on the hot patio every day and watch the arrival of worried family members run walking into the hospital or the person who left the hospital and found the patio and could hold in the tears, not one second more. And that trembling hand covered their face. And then I'd see people in, in different colored hospital uniforms, the, the white coats, the blue scrubs, connecting and laughing. The vulnerability of this place had become normal for them. And there I'd sit eating my lunch praying for their situations in my heart while swatting away the bugs. I was there as part of this ragtag group of new chaplains emerging from seminaries and learning together. Our, our eyes were probably as bugged out as cicadas as we visited patient after patient. We were probably almost as awkward it was called clinical pastoral education. And it was designed to help us notice what we were bringing with us into pastoral encounters so that we might be able to actually be present to people in pain rather than getting all tripped up in our own stuff. Now in 2004, I had a very thick Southern accent. I mean, it's eroded a little over the years. and it'll, it'll pick right up when I talk to a relative. I like my accent. But in my chaplaincy, I noticed that often a patient's first question was, where are you from? I mean, it happened easily 10 times a day. And it started to hurt. I told my group, I think... When people hear my accent, they don't assume it's a good thing. It's like they think I'm not, I'm not very smart. And then a woman named Angela spoke up. She was from the UK, and her voice was kind and firm like Mary Poppins. And she said, oh, my dear. I have the opposite problem. People think I am much smarter than I actually am. And we all laughed about that. Where are you from? Does your upbringing give you clout or a shell that you wish you could shed? Does your hometown generate pride or require explanation? Each of us is part of a family tree planted in a certain patch of ground that from time to time buzzes with a certain sound, whether we like it or not. And in today's text, we overhear an offhand comment lobbed toward Jesus. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? 
Now, if you ask a question like that, like the one that Nathaniel asked Philip and the gang from Bethsaida about Jesus, you're probably not assuming that Nazareth is an up-and-coming place, an enlightened place, a place you've been wanting to visit, a fancy place. When Nathaniel hears that Jesus, son of God, son of man, anointed one, king of Israel, or any of the other eight sparkling titles that he is given in this text is from Nazareth. He might as well have heard Podunk or Brooklyn. In today's text, we get a glimpse of how the first Christians were no stranger to bias and baggage around where people are from. And we also see how Jesus in this moment completely transforms this interaction into one of true belonging and a call tailor-made to Nathaniel. Now, bias comes from the French word that means slant. Nathaniel saw Nazareth with a certain slant. Now, John Wesley, in his commentary on this text, calls it a prejudice. Prejudice comes from the Latin word meaning to judge ahead, to judge ahead of time. Ahead of time. Something made Nathaniel think that Nazareth was a redneck, boony, backwater, undesirable place. And who knows where that baggage came from? Maybe as a good Jew, Nathaniel knew that Nazareth didn't appear anywhere in the Old Testament or the Talmud or, or the Midrash. So perhaps it was an unlikely home for a savior. Maybe at a population of about 480 people at the time, Nazareth really was, was barely a stoplight on the road. Maybe Nazareth was known for carpenters and other folks who work with their hands, and, and Nathaniel assumed that they were poorly educated or simple or of no consequence. But maybe his slant went to a darker place, to a corrosive opinion that those from the outside were barbaric, brutal, possibly dangerous. When the whiff of bias or condescension or prejudice hangs in the air, most people pick up on it right away. And as it collects, it becomes toxic to belonging. It stings the soul. Now, sometimes it can start off innocent enough. Oh, yes, I've known plenty of Texans. Oh, you're an oaky. Other times the bias opens up a huge breach between people. He's just a good old boy. She's one of those New England types. What do you expect from San Francisco? A friend of mine who is of mixed ethnicity told me once, when people ask you where you're from over and over again, it gets so exhausting. The question can start to feel like wherever you're from, you don't really belong here. Well, next in our story, Jesus claims to know where Nathaniel is from, too. And it's surprising to him. You're an Israelite without a deceitful bone in your body. Now, Don, just where did you get to know me? Nathaniel asked. There it is. You hear that? The insecure question, the embarrassment, the defensiveness, the mental playback of other awkward things that he might have said. But Jesus says he just, he just saw Nathaniel just sitting over under the fig tree. That's it. That's all. Nothing more. I saw you sitting over there, Jesus says. But there was more to it. That fig tree, it has deep roots all the way back to Micah where it's written, everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree. 
and no one shall make them afraid. That fig tree has roots all the way back to Eden, to the place where humanity and God were together in perfect belonging until sin created a barrier between them. And Adam and Eve hid themselves with fig leaves. Jesus sees Nathanael under the fig tree and assumes lovability, assumes worthiness, assumes, as a Messiah would, that nothing can separate us from the goodness of God, not a hometown, not an unfortunate question, not the way we dress or speak or who we love, nothing at all. This is more than giving Nathaniel the benefit of the doubt. It is the promise of a new start beyond bias and baggage and brokenness that Nathaniel senses on some deep level has blocked him from, from fruitfulness, from freedom. And in an instant, Nathaniel feels seen, more, more welcomed than ever in his life. He feels beloved. And that is how he comes to believe. Not through a convincing argument or or a great book, or a great sermon, but through the experience of the one who loved him first. Some people want to make the Christian life into a set of complicated tomes and mental acrobatics. Others into a set of buildings or behaviors all designed to get past the the bouncer at the gate of heaven. But from the very beginning, Jesus simply extends the invitation. Come and see. Come and see past your assumptions. Come and see beyond what you've heard. Come and see beyond your past hurts. Come and see past the skepticism and judgments that have clouded your vision, not just toward fellow travelers and God, but toward yourself. Maybe you don't quite understand how a savior operates, and that would be normal. But the invitation is to come and see. And when we realize how very good this news is, church, Church can become the telescope through which people view the vast kingdom of God. Church can be the hospital where broken hearts find meaning and learning and laughter, where we are made new in Christ Jesus. St. Augustine wrote that faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of this faith is to see what you believe. Jesus told Nathaniel, you will see greater things than these. You'll start to see people as fellow citizens of the commonwealth of God's love. You'll start to live your life rather than just comment on it. And that changes everything. This week in our Bible study, I heard some incredible stories about what people have seen as they stepped out from behind the brush and risked this Jesus journey, such as the opportunity to work in a nursing home and for the first time, feel your own heart come alive with purpose. Or the gift of a friend next door asking you over and over again to come with her to church. Are you ready yet? She'd say with a smile. And then one day, being ready to say yes. The gift of someone willing to hold your whole story as messy and woundy as it is. Listening to you all day on a Friday 
and then calling back on Saturday and saying, I don't think we're done yet. And listening that whole day too. Until the truth shined out of the rubble. Or being from the church your whole life and yet having that snap of recognition one day at the communion table that Jesus was really present to you too. This week I read a poem by David White. It's called Second Sight. And I'll end by sharing it with you because I think it so beautifully conveys the power of this journey of call we are on with Christ Jesus, King of Israel, Son of God. Sometimes you need the ocean light and colors you've never seen painted before through an evening sky. Sometimes you need your God to be a simple revelation, not a telling word of wisdom. Sometimes you need only the first shyness that comes from being shown things far beyond your understanding so that you can fly and become free and being still by being still and by being here. And there are times you need to be brought to ground by touch and touch alone to know those arms around you and to make your home in the world just by being wanted, to see those eyes looking back at you as eyes should see you at last. Seeing you as you always wanted to be seen. Seeing you as you yourself had always wanted to see the world. Come and see. And may it be so. Amen. Amen. Now we come to our time of the prayers of the people. And you are invited to list your prayer joys and concerns in the prayer chats. We also want to remember in our um, Trinity cycle of prayer, the folks you see listed there, we'll remember them in our prayers. But we also want to keep a uh, family of uh, son of Bob and Kathy Brown, Keith Brown, most of whom are currently experiencing the challenges of COVID. We want to remember the family of Sophia Brown as they are approaching the 14th birthday of their dear departed Gabriella and uh, hold them in our hearts and in our prayers as they mourn her loss and remember the gift that she was and continues to be for them. We pray too for Brian Carley and Lee Cheatham, who were married yesterday. Congratulations, Betty Ida Miller and all your family for that joyous occasion. We pray for Richard Day, Janet Moore, and Jean Lucas, all who are in rehabilitation centers recovering from hospitalizations. And we remember in our Trinity cycle of prayer, Terry and Bill Haneke, Susan and Greg Indrasano and their daughters, Ariel and Serena, Sue and John Jelinski, Esther Johnson. In our Presbyterian cycle of prayer, the folks at the First United Presbyterian Church of Dale City and the Furnace Mountain Presbyterian Church in Leesburg, Virginia. As well, we are grateful for and give thanks to Jean Lucas for the flowers that you see over my shoulder given to the glory of God and in memory of his parents, Bill and Francis and Lucas. With all these prayers, with all these hopes, with these concerns and with these joys, we gather them up from wherever we are 
and come to God in prayer. Let us pray. God of north, south, east, and west, we've been meaning to say thank you. Thank you for scooping up the dirt and breathing life into it and giving us all life. Thank you for forming this body, this life, this world, all these people, for drawing us in, for holding us up, for weaving us together, even when it's hard, especially, Lord, especially when it is hard. So today we come to you in prayer with gratitude overflowing, gratitude for the places we've been, for the people who have shaped us, for the spaces we call home. But we also come to you, O God, with prayers on our hearts. Praying during this Pride Month for everyone at whatever stage they are in as they embrace their own belovedness as God's own. We pray too for those who are hungry, for those hospitalized, here and around the world, particularly those places that are overrun with COVID and haven't had the opportunities we have had with vaccinations here in this country. We pray for those for whom loneliness feels like a second pandemic, for parents who are exhausted even as we finally reach the end of the school year for parents, for teachers, for school administrators, for students, all. <sighs> May they take a deep breath and renew and rest in this summertime. For those who have grief that hovers far too close and is far too heavy, we pray as well, O oh God. And we ask you to scoop us all up like you scooped up that dirt on that first day. Hold our hearts alongside our worries. Relieve us of our burdens. Protect us in the palm of your hand. Draw us closer to one another as you do. God of creation, you have always been, you always are our first home. And we are inviting you in to us, O oh Lord. Come and see. Come into our hearts, Lord Jesus. Hear our prayers from the spaces we call home today. Hear us now as we offer our silent prayers to you. All these things we pray in the good and gracious and welcoming name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, having offered our prayers to God, we have the opportunity to offer our gifts to God. You can do so online, if you like, using the online way that you can give that is on our church website. We also are able to take advantage of still giving through the mail, or you can drop off your gift at the church office during the One of the other ways we have the ability to offer of ourselves, as we mentioned earlier, the opportunity to be a live stream volunteer. We'll have that chance fleshed out more in the coming week on Wednesday night. But we also have need for other kinds of volunteers as we are regathering together. And I want to call on Brian Dunbar to share a special opportunity that's waiting for just the right person. Brian? I'm happy to be together with you and looking forward to the day soon when we'll all be together in person. As you might expect, a lot goes on behind the scenes to make our services a meaningful event for all. An integral part of the team effort to make our in-person services successful are the ushers. These teams of dedicated individuals perform a number of duties at each service to ensure 
that the event runs smoothly. They welcome members and guests as they arrive, distribute bulletins, assist individuals with seating, take attendance, collect a weekly offering, and at the end of the sanctuary, at the end of the <clears throat> service, tidy up the sanctuary amongst many other duties as well. I'm here today to solicit your assistance in filling the position of the usher coordinator, a role that I've filled for several years, which is basically that of head usher. Uh, it's not particularly difficult or time consuming, but it's a wonderful way to give back to the church we all love. Duties entail such things as ensuring usher teams are properly staffed, engaging with the pastors and worship team, ensuring expanded usher coverage for special services such as Christmas and Easter services, and ensuring all plans and instructions for the ushers are kept up to date. Although the usher coordinator is a member of the worship team, there are no formal meeting requirements associated with this position. That makes it perfect for someone who wants to meaningfully give back, but is unable to commit to regular weekday meetings. For those relatively new to the church who are looking for a great service opportunity, this is it. For those members looking for a new opportunity to give back, this is it. I'd ask each of you to prayerfully consider if this is something you want to do to help your church as well as help others. If it sounds interesting, you could contact me, Beck and Stephen, or Char Wales from the worship team. I thank you for your time and again ask you to prayerfully consider this great service opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, both for your announcement and for your years of really dedicated service. We thank you so much. You have been such a gift for us and for our church. And I uh, hope you notice all the applauding hands across the screens on uh, the Zoom worship today. Thank you. That's all for you, Brian. Thanks so much.
Now it is my blessing and privilege to offer an invitation to discipleship, which is just what it is, an invitation to be a disciple of Jesus Christ with this body of believers gathered here virtually and hopefully soon in person on a regular basis, where we seek to try to follow in the ways of Jesus and to be faithful disciples of Jesus our Lord and Savior. If you feel called to answering the call of Jesus here with us, we welcome you. All you need to do is to mention it in the chat. We'll be glad to gather with you as we say virtually, whisked into our virtual chapel where Becca and I, along with a couple of elders, will receive you into our membership. Come and see. Answer the call. Jesus is calling you, even as Jesus calls us all. Amen. And now go into this world. Go knowing that the Lord goes before you. The Lord has called you, is calling you still. And where the Lord calls, the Lord also equips you for the ability to put those gifts into the direction of the healing of this world, you will see greater things than perhaps we could even imagine through the eyes of the Savior. That spirit goes beside you, walks with you, and even abides in you. Let us serve the Lord together. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face and make it to shine upon you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you and give to you all, each and every single one, peace. Amen. Amen.